All right, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight and spending your Thursday evening with us. This is such a fantastic crowd. Um, my name is Amali and I'm the events director here at Books for Magic. We are so excited to have Jamel Brinkley and Garth Greenwell with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Jamel's newest short story collection, Witness. Before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Jamel will be signing and personalizing books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of Witness online using the link in the live stream description. All right, let's get into this. In Witness, Jamel explores the impact of seeing and being seen, whether by examining a couple in a photograph, eyeing someone in a crowd, realizing the slow but steady changes happening to a neighborhood, and so much more. These stories are alluring, contemplative, and exhilarating, as we too are taking, taken along for the ride, witnessing these occurrences just as the characters are experiencing them. Jamel Brinkley is the author of A Lucky Man, which won the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence and was a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction, the Story Prize, the John Leonard Prize, and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. His work has appeared in the Paris Review, A Public Space, Plowshares, and the Best American Short Stories. He was raised in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, and currently teaches at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. As I mentioned earlier, Garth Greenwell joins Jamal in conversation tonight. Garth is the author of Cleanness and What Belongs to You. A new novel, Small Rain, is forthcoming next year, and beginning this fall, he will be a distinguished writer in, in residence at NYU. All right, that is all from me. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Jamel and Garth. Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you to Books or Magic for hosting. It's nice to see such a broad cross-section of people from my life here. Um, old friends, new friends, um, students, former students, uh, fellow writers is very exciting. Um, thank you to my agent and my editor, uh, my publicist at FSG. Um, and of course, thank you, Garth, my good friend. For 10 years now, we've been Ten friends, years. believe it or not. Wild. Um, thank you so much for doing this event with me. I appreciate it. Um, full disclosure, I did not sleep very well last night, which explains my general appearance right now. Um, <clears throat> so I was just so nervous about this event for some reason. But um, I'm going to read a little bit, just for a few minutes, from a story in the collection titled That Particular Sunday. <laughs> The sabbatical nature of Sundays had everything to do with the time I would spend with Mary, time which never had to be announced. My mother would simply watch, pleasantly at a loss, as I dressed in a clash of color, down to the mismatched socks, and soon after, I would throw my small body into her arms, and we would leave without saying a word. Or, more rarely, our intercom would buzz, on those Sundays, Mary and I played or read or watched television together in apartment 4B, or maybe we romped in the local park. But more typically, my mother and I would leave the neighborhood behind. What I'm referring to now is the actual past, the genuine past, the Sundays that had the patina of the golden age, time's verifiable signature. My mother displayed almost no confusion then. 
matters were simpler. She didn't call me by the name of one of my younger brothers, that casual error she makes now. She couldn't. It was years before Keith or Richard would ever be born, would even be born. We lived in the neighborhood before it was a real estate agent's dream. The historical record describes that era of Fort Greene with words like abandoned, poverty stricken, crime ridden, and with references to crack. Words that are impossible to believe or even tolerate given the form and mood of my memories. As my mother and I strolled through and away from the area on a typical Sunday toward the subway station that would take us to the part of Brooklyn now known as Little Haiti, the corners, windows, and stoops were florid with faces and brilliant patterns of clothing. Far from abandoned, everything was proudly and ostentatiously claimed. Sometimes Leora, the liveliest of my aunts, dead now, would be with us, jutting her mandible out at cat callers, teasing my mother for telling me to talk proper, calling her girl in 12 different tones, tapping me on the shoulder to point out a squirrel spiraling up a tree. Walking between Aunt Leora and my mother, I had to step double time to keep up but I made sure to go slowly enough not to interfere with the delicious sensation of being drawn along by them. The dampness of my palms like a glue that stuck my hands to theirs. As long as I live, I will never forget the tug and pulse of that neighborhood feeling, that family feeling. Here it is, and here I am. Thank you. Technical pause. <laughs> it's nice with the lights off, though. I like that. The sort of intimacy. Jamel, um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, it's really a privilege and a joy to get to celebrate this book with you. And I wanted to start, um, I have some very nerdy questions, but I want to start with just a very general question about witness and the idea of witness. Um, the word itself, witness, actually doesn't appear all that often in the book. I think it appears four or five times in the text of the book. Actually, not that much more frequently than it appears in your first book. Hmm. Um, so, you know, obviously something you've been interested in for a long time, but the stories, I mean, each story is in a different way, a kind of profound engagement with the question of what witness is. There's a story that's called witness. There's a story that's called bystander. I'm interested and if you could talk a little bit about um, the kinds of witness you're interested in, what is the difference between a witness and a bystander? And what is the relationship between witness and action? Yeah, it's a beautiful question, thank you. Um, I think I would start by saying that, you know, as is obvious from the epigraph page of the book, one of the presiding spirits of this collection is, is James Baldwin. Um, who speaks a lot about the idea of witness. Um, and I think the way that he talks about witness that's perhaps most interesting to me is an idea related to the confrontation with the realities of life, the willing confrontation with the realities of life. Um, there's a beautiful essay of his that students of mine would probably know because I assign it all the time or refer to it all the time. Um, it's called The Uses of the Blues. And in that essay, he, he talks right at the outset about the fact that he's not really talking about music per se. He doesn't know music, he says. What he's really talking about um, is this question of, of what is your attitude towards the, the experience of life? The essay might as well have been called The Uses of Pain or The Uses of Anguish. And he draws a contrast between the ways that um, African Americans culturally have dealt with that confrontation through artistic mediums like the blues or jazz. The blues are all about disasters, floods, 
um, heartbreak, work, lynchings, things of that nature. And the capacity to, to face those facts and to bear witness articulately and to wring a kind of articulate joy out of it is what he's interested in. And he contrasts that with what he calls the American dream version, where we have things like Life Magazine, which give you this sort of pretty surface level um, depiction of life. Um, and I think that the kind of confrontation that he's talking about, specifically through the blues, but I would also add jazz and um, some hip hop, um, the kinds of music that have affected me, that's, that's the kind of witness that I'm interested in. Um, the kind of witness that is about something that, that seems on the surface like it's a very easy thing to do, to confront the difficulties of life, but in fact it's quite difficult. Um, so difficult, in fact, that that confrontation is, is essentially what he calls a craft. It's, it's part of the craft of, of expression. Um, being willing to, to face those difficulties and then to, to bear witness in a way that's articulate and that's beautiful. You know, so that's so interesting because that, that really sort of blurs the line then between expression and action like a relationship to language and a relationship to acts, to acts. It seems to me that a kind of typical or one typical Jamel Brinkley character has a really complicated relationship to both expression and to action. And I'm gonna do that annoying thing where someone reads to you from your own work. <laughs> so one of the remarkable stories in the book is Arrows, which I thought was your first ghost story, although, but you just schooled me a little bit and said that maybe, maybe it's not your first or your only ghost story, but it's a ghost story, an unambiguous ghost story. It's also a ghost story with a sex scene involving the ghost, um, <laughs> which I think is pretty terrific. <laughs> and in that story, the narrator Hassan articulates what he calls a theory and the theory is called the arrow of time. And he says that some people, and here's where the quote begins, some people tolerate the past, give it their merest acknowledgement, the way you might quickly raise and lower your head to a passing stranger. Other people, people who tend to become ghosts are different. They're the ones who turn around to face the past and they get impaled by the arrow stuck on something that happened to them or on an obsession, they're the ones who can't accept people's inevitably forward movement through the entanglements of time. So that's a description of ghosts, but it seems to me a fair characterization of a lot of your characters in that their life in the present is impeded by something in the past. I'm interested in the relationship between that state and witness the way Hassan expresses it, facing the past, that seems like a posture of witness. You know, in the Baldwin quote that you use as an epigraph, Baldwin draws a distinction between witness and action. But I wondered reading your stories and reading, especially engaging with these characters who I find um, deeply moving, which is also, I mean, in itself, I'm interested in that. Um, how you make characters who are so static, so unable to act or to connect with other, how you make them so moving. But, um, you know, witness can be an action. So I mentioned that the word witness appears just a few times in the book. It appears one time in a way that people might not recognize because it appears in Greek. And the Greek word for witness is martyr. And I wondered whether martyrdom martyrdom understood as an action of bearing witness. I think of the unnamed narrator of your story, Bartow Station, mm -hmm. who deliberately wears shoes. He's a UPS driver. He deliberately wears shoes that destroy his feet. He's dropped out of college despite the fact that he's clearly talented. Um, he's sort of stepped out of his life in a way. Love is available to him and he shuts the door in its face or the character Simone in Comfort, is the way that they punish themselves, the way that they 
seem to act out a kind of penance. Is that an act of witness? Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I think um, one thing that occurs to me is that I would maybe draw a distinction between a character like Hassan in, in, in Arrows and a character like the unnamed narrator in Barto Station. Um, I think they're both obsessed with the past or they've been kind of possessed by the past. Right. Um, but if I were to put those two characters side by side, I would say that Hassan is, is the character who is really trapped by the past, even more so than the unnamed narrator of the other story. So I guess I would I would back up first and say that I'm I'm really interested in the, in ideas of temporal entanglement. Yeah. Um, that the past isn't neatly the past, the present isn't neatly the present, the future isn't neatly the future, and I'm interested in how to narrate that entanglement. Yeah. Um, so I always think about you know certain kinds of narrative structures that we find, sort of like the, the typical contemporary short story structure style that starts in the present, which is sort of neatly blocked off by a white space or something, and then you have the past. Right. And then we sort of leave the past and we go back to the present. And the, the past is sort of slotted in there to explain something or provide some context, um, perhaps to show why the character is acting the way that they are in the present. And I'm interested in sort of messing with that, with that structure um, and making the distinctions between those temporal frameworks more fluid. Um, in the story Arrows, I think that Hassan is so impaled by the past that his every action is determined by the past, by his unwillingness to forgive um, he's set on his ways, and he doesn't change his ways. The character that you're um, talking about in um, Bartow Station, he too is possessed by the past. He wears those shoes, as you mentioned, that hurt his feet. Um, he can't help but think about what's happened in the past with his, with his cousin. But with that story, I think there's, there are glimmers of something. You can see possibilities with this character. The way that he engages with his labor, with his work. Um, the fact that he takes pleasure in the way that he navigates the city. And there's a way that I think that he, even though he too is also wrapped up in this entanglement of time, he's not so um, seamlessly locked into the past. But I think all my characters, or most of them anyway, are sort of wrestling with this entanglement of time. And they react to it differently. And you mentioned, oh, actually, before I ask another question, I want to say we're going to open up to your all's questions at about quarter till. So please be thinking about your questions. Um, also, it's hot up here, so I'm just <laughs> going to be the southern lady that I am. Just, <laughs> so don't be distract. Don't let that distract you. Right, over here. Yeah, I know. It's, it's warm. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned narrative shapes, and you know, I'm I'm also was interested in how your sense of time affects the shapes of the stories, mm -hmm. and especially how these arrows of time, you know, that event that is the sort of puncture on which a character is caught, lends itself to a particular narrative shape that several of your stories take, which is a story that is built around a delayed reveal. Yeah. And I'm interested in that because it seems as I, one of the things I felt as I was reading Witness, um, and also it's also true of several stories in The Lucky Man, I was wondering, like, how does this keep working again and again? Like, how do you keep that? From I mean, because often I read stories, like I, often, I hate actually, something that I really hate is where I feel like, oh, this author knows something that they're just not telling me for a long time because they want a cheap effect. It doesn't feel like a cheap effect in your stories. So how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you think that I'm doing it. Um, 
I would say a couple of things, or at least there are a few things that I think about when I'm working with that narrative shape. Um, one is that it can't be something that's done for, um, for the benefit of the reader. Um, I'm not thinking primarily about withholding from the reader or giving something to the reader. Um, if something is being withheld for a reveal, it's because that character truly does not want to fess up about right. what it is directly. And I say directly because I think what the characters are doing, even before the reveal happens, you feel the irradiation yeah. of that, the thing that's going to be revealed throughout the story. You know something is there. You know the character's dealing with it, the character's feeling it, the character's wrestling with it, the character's thinking about it. Um, but not so much in narrative form, this is what happened. Right. Um, so that's important for me, that you feel the weight of the thing. Um, the other thing that's important to me is, is that the reveal is not really the, the end of the story. The story doesn't land on the reveal. Um, I want there to be something after the reveal, something follows the reveal. The story continues. Um, the present, you know, um, forces itself into the story again. So again, with uh, Bartow Station, there was that delayed reveal. The reveal is pressured into being in that story, but it doesn't land there. It doesn't end with, oh, this is what happened. This is why I act the way that I do. The story continues. He has a job. He has to get up and go to work the next day. Um, the relationship, the primary relationship in that story is essentially over, but his life continues. Yeah. And so it, it doesn't feel as though the story was um, manufactured simply for the reveal, I hope. <laughs> I want it to feel more like the story was, the, re the reveal was forced. Mm -hmm. It had to come here. Um, there was no way that we could get out of this story without this reveal, even if the narrator would not want to reveal it. Right. And, but once that reveal happens, life goes on, yeah. right? And that's the part of the, the temporal entanglement that I think is important, right? You can't get stuck in the past. Yeah. You have to remember that the narrative has a present story and it has future possibility as well. You know, I feel that so much about a story like The Let Out, where there's also a reveal but then it seems to me that the sort of, the reveal is not the culmination of a kind of narrative energy, but instead, right. you know, the, the energy continues in the consequences of the reveal. Yeah. It also seemed to me that, um, like in Bartow Station especially, I'm, I'm fascinated by things that you do with tone in this book, because I think in this book, in a way that I don't think I felt, or maybe only once in A Lucky Man, in Witness, there are several spots where there is a violent shift of tone. Mm -hmm. And one of them, and I wondered if this was part of why the reveal in Bartow Station felt so satisfying. The narrator's confession, and he calls it a confession, occurs in a style that is utterly unique in your work. And that also kind of lifts the story, in my experience of it, away from realism. Because all of a sudden, he starts sounding like a Zabald narrator. And there's this, like, there are these, you know, there are sentences that are three quarters of a page long, yeah. which is not true anywhere else in your work. I'm interested, can you, can you talk about how you felt that a couple of these, violent, what I call violent shifts, it's a little misleading to call them that because they happen at the beginning of stories. Like the very first, the opening of the first story. Yeah. Um, or that particular Sunday also opens in a very sort of distinct, almost kind of Jamesian way. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about managing those kinds of, for, why are you interested in those kinds of shifts of tone and then managing them in the context of a story? Yeah. I think one reason I'm interested in those shifts of tone is because I feel like I know people who enact those shifts. Mm -hmm. And it's always fascinating to me. Like someone can be quite terse um, almost stingy with their language. They don't, yeah. they don't really want to speak to you, um, or they're reluctant to speak. And when they do speak, um, the utterance is, is so simple, um, stripped down, um, almost as though they don't want to 
mistakenly reveal something. Right. You know, so they strip their language down to the, yeah. to the bare bones. And occasionally, if you're fortunate, you get to see what's behind that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think of those kinds of sentences as, as little dams, yeah. behind that language, there's such a, a, a force of, of observation and experience and expertise and life. Um, and so again, to think about that narrator in, in Bartow Station, one reason I, I love that character is, is because you can tell that he's sort of, you know, he, you talked about his shoes, that yeah. those pinched shoes. He's got a pinched existence. Yeah. Um, and there's a way in which he's withholding himself. He's like, he just does not want to share his humanity. Yeah. But sometimes something <laughs> opens. And all you need is enough of an opening for that humanity to rush out. And then you see the full range of tones that someone is capable of, you know? Um, and I think it's what's delightful about anyone. Everyone has that, that range of tone, the range of tonality, the kinds of observations and expertise and um, rhythms that they can make. And that, that shift was, was really pleasurable for me because it felt like th this is what, this is the richness that this character on a day-to-day -day basis refuses to reveal. Mm. You know, and instead it's, it's a stripped down existence. This way of punishing himself. We talked about punishment earlier. You know, I can't allow myself to <laughs> communicate my full humanity. Um, I mean, I, you're going to be really embarrassed by this question, but and it's a really hard question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really hard question to answer honestly, but I'm honestly interested in it. So, um, Bartow Station, and it, and it has something to do with that moment and with the aftermath of that moment, which is, for me, hugely unexpected and devastating. Um, that tone, something about that tone and the fact that the story is able to accommodate it is part of what makes that story feel to me depthless. Um, I'm really taken, you know I've, I've told you this, but... Um, I think that story, um, it has just, you know, I, since I first read this book when you gave me the ARC like six months ago, that story sort of sank its claws in me and hasn't let go. I think it's as good as things get. Like I really, when I read it, I feel like, well, this is like my favorite stories by William Trevor or by Henry James. Like this is just as good as it gets. What did it feel like to write that? <laughs> that is really embarrassing. And did you, but, it's, but it's a true question because I, I really am curious because on one hand I feel like we never know the value of what we've made like we can't know good or bad on the other hand when I read certain poems by Emily Dickinson I feel like surely she knew that was great <laughs> did you know that story was great <laughs> honest question. Answer it honestly. I'm not going to answer that part. Um, <laughs> That's the only question. That's the only part. <laughs> How did it feel to write this? Story? How did it feel to write? Yeah, fair. I can, I can maybe answer that. Okay. Um, you know, what, this might be interesting to you, but the seed of that story actually was graffiti. Interesting. That actually yeah. doesn't surprise me. Yeah. And and. The backstory is that I tried years ago to write a story about a graffiti artist, and it was awful <laughs> because I had only I had you know sort of a you know factual knowledge of what it meant to to be a graffiti writer, a, graf a graffiti artist, and so the story was just sort of like you know um, just hitting its marks, not really doing anything right. special, and I wanted to find a way. I think what I realized is that I wanted to find a way, what I really wanted to write about was the fascination of graffiti for someone like me. That's what I really wanted to write about. So instead of trying to occupy the, the, the point of view or the space of an actual graffiti artist, what I wanted to try to capture was the beauty of the form and the fascination it holds for people who love it. Um, and so, it felt good to, to find the angle and the distance that I needed, you know? Um, I think so often in writing, we talk about the solution to a writing problem being to get closer to the thing, you know, get closer, get closer. 
But sometimes, actually, a, a, a very fine sure. solution is yeah. to pull away pull and to get a little yeah. bit of distance. Um, and I think finding that solution of distance and capturing or hoping that I captured those characters' fascination with the art form, that was important to me. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is that I was also thinking a lot about um, PTSD mm -hmm. um, for many reasons, um, just the existence of it in my personal life or familial life and thinking about, well, how do you narrate that? Yeah. And of course it's been done, right? Um, but I wanted, I wanted to do it in a way that felt like it was very much engaged with the life of the city, mm -hmm. that felt too like it had possibility. Mm -hmm. So even though the, the, the main desire of the story or the, the main possibility of the story um, flames out, it doesn't work out, yeah. it was important for me to write about PTSD and a character who is so oppressed by it. Mm -hmm. It was important for me to write about it in a way that saw glimmers of possibility, glimmers of hope, glimmers of happiness, glimmers of, hey, sometimes my days are okay. Right. And that felt good. Yeah. You know, so um, you've mentioned Baldwin. I've mentioned Zabel. I know that stories in the collection um, sort of tip their hat at various points. Mm -hmm. And one of the pleasures of reading your work is sort of hearing the sound of other voices. Yeah. So at one moment, I was telling you before the event, at one moment I hear the poet Carl Phillips, yeah. who provided the epigraph for your first book. Um, I know that there are stories that are tips of the hat to William Trevor, to Gene Stafford. Can you talk about, I guess, your relationship with the tradition or the traditions that you're working within, and whether you think of writing as a kind of conversation with these great figures from the past. Yeah, um, I absolutely do. Um, there are a few ways that I think about it. Um, I, I love I love when when writers take the kind of boring, common wisdoms of knowledge of, of writing and kind of transform them to make them interesting. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, write what you know. Yeah. Right, which is Sure, <laughs> but <clears throat> a more interesting version of that that I encountered years ago was a lot of what you know is literature, Yeah. right? And so, and then th th they get you to thinking about the tradition of homage, right? Uh, which is all over the map um, and the interesting things that writers can do with it. So thinking of Alice Munro's Labor Day dinner as an homage to the dead. Right, or thinking of something like A and P and, and Araby, you know, right. on and on and on. Um, I love that tradition of homage, and it feels to me very much like um, like an aesthetic that for me comes out of hip hop. Actually, mm. um, I was talking to our mutual friend David Owen, and he said, you know, it, it feels to me like when, when you do that, and you know, some of your stories do this, but it feels like it's, it feels like sampling. Mm -hmm. Now, like, that's exactly how I think of it, David, yeah. actually. You know, did, you can take a piece of something and transform it or change the tempo of it, change the tonality of it to tell a whole different story and create something new. Yeah. Um, while also sort of paying respect to artists who came before you um, so that's absolutely how I think of, of that when I do that um, in new stories. And you're right, so there's, um, there's Baldwin, but specifically in terms of the stories of William Trevor, there's Gina Berrio, a writer that I love. Um, Richard Curry mm -hmm. is a writer that I'm winking at. Uh, the first story in the collection sort of, I don't think I was fully conscious of this, but there's a, there's a story by an underappreciated African-American writer, Henry Dumas, um, called The Ark of Bones. Mm. It's a first-person narrative, and in the beginning of that story, the narrator is being pursued by a character named Head Eye. Mm. And he's sort of this nuisance character, you know, and so thinking of Head Ass in my story yeah. is like a, 
cousin or something to, to that character, Head Eye. That's great. Um, it's the kind of thing, it's, it's really pleasurable to do things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this question is all about me because I've been feeling <laughs> guilty about something. I've been carrying this for a couple of weeks, which is that, so this guy who writes reviews for a gay paper texted me after he saw me tweeting about Bart Barto Station and he read Barto Station, it came out in the Boston Review, so he read it before the book was out and he loved it. His remit is to review gay books. And so he wrote me and he said, is there any way <laughs> I can review this book as a gay book? And I sent him back a text which literally said, these are very heterosexual stories. <laughs> and I've just felt terrible ever since. And so I've been um, thinking about that and actually thinking, well, maybe not. Like actually thinking that maybe it's a little more complicated. So, um, and in part, I take permission from um, the first story in, in Lucky Man, which is a great story, no more than a bubble, oh, yeah. in which one of the characters says, there's always more to what you want than what you wanted. You have to take that too. And I started thinking about the fact that actually queerness or homosociality, to take a Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, is all over your stories. And in fact, very often relationships between men and women heterosexual relationships, romantic relationships, are actually about relationships between men. Mm -hmm. So that um, first story in A Lucky Man, um, these two friends are put in a sexual situation with each other yeah. in a heterosexual context, but that makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. Other characters, there's a character who's estranged from his father because accidentally he touched his father in an quote unquote inappropriate way. Um, in uh, the first story of Witness, we will learn that this narrator is estranged from a friend because maybe he made a pass at him. I'm interested in hearing about that, in hearing about, and I guess I'll also say, you know, I know that you get frustrated sometimes with how often people talk about A Lucky Man as a book about masculinity. And, um, you know, in Witness, you know, in A Lucky Man, there's only one story that has a glimpse of a female POV. Um, in this book, female POVs are all over the place. I do think A Lucky Man is a book about masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's also about love and about how masculinity forms and deforms mm -hmm. love and love between men. Yeah. So I'm interested in that, in sort of love between men in your books as something that these characters cherish and also as something that scares the shit out of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I think... I think I'm always looking for something other than the most obvious thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if you're writing a story about, you know, a heterosexual relationship, I, I want to be able to tilt the story so that the entire web of relations catches the light, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned the scholarly work that's been done on this issue. And of course, I mean, of course, it's, it's of course, of yeah. course, um, you can't sort of isolate, you know, this one kind of relationship from um homosocial relationships or um from homosexual desire or whatever the case may be and so for me it's it's most interesting in a story to be able to as i said tilt the story so that i'm seeing as many webs of of relation as possible mm -hmm. and sometimes those webs of relation are explicitly about um male friendships or male familiar relations or even, you know, some hint of, of male-male desire. Um, but sometimes those things are kind of in the shadow. You can only see them if you look at, tilt the story in the right way, you know. Um, a lot of my favorite writers can sort of 
take you there. Like, even mm-hmm. someone like William Trevor, who's sure. sort of the last person you might expect, right? He'll be writing a story about a husband and a wife or a widow, and all of a sudden the story is actually about the widow and her sister. Right. And it's, it's not what you, you know, so, so the story is able to um, show you the intricacy, the interconnected nature of all these relationships in a way that I always admire. So I think um, one thing I said, I remember that I said probably quite a lot when A Lucky Man came out was that, you know, sometimes the love of your life can be your brother yeah. or your cousin yeah. or um, your parent, your child, well, whoever. It could be, you know, so, so taking that charge the kind of charge that you can find in um, a phrase like the love of your life, but actually applying it to all kinds of relationships mm-hmm. and showing that there is, there are um, these sort of moments of, of, of desire, of intimacy there that the characters often don't know what to do with. Right. Um, that's important to me to capture because I think it's, it's most interesting. It's not boring. I don't want to be bored. Right. You know, and sometimes it's kind of the head on you know, it's a this relationship. So something like, again, we keep going back to Bartow Station, but the relationship between the main character of that story and the woman that he meets is crucial. But for me, the story is only interesting because all these other yeah. relations become activated. His relationship with his coworkers, his right. male coworkers, his relationship with his cousin in the past. You know, those things are, are vital to the world of the story feeling um, as rich and as complicated as possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, and this will be my last question. So you guys, I hope you're ready with some of yours. Um, you know, one of the things that's remarkable about your stories um, is a kind of lyricism that you sometimes allow yourself and sort of lines where suddenly um, you know, there's a line in Bartow Station where the woman he meets reminds him of girls that he and his cousin used to, like, play fight with. And there's a phrase that is, or a clause that is, hands that sudden and seize the air. Mm-hmm. And that use of the adverb, sudden, or the, you know, that, or adjective, sudden as a verb. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm interested in your relationship to poetry. Mm and whether a relationship with poetry has been important to your education as a prose writer. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna tread carefully here, sitting next to the poet. And there are poets in the audience too, so. Um, <clears throat> I'm always afraid to say this, but you know, a lot of my earliest writings were, were in the form of poetry. Um, and I came sort of late to to fiction, actually. Um, So I think a certain kind of pleasure in, first of all, um, the sound of language, the rhythm of language, the order of words, um, where the emphases are, like that's been very important to me. The multiple meanings that words can have, that's been really important to me. but also thinking, you know, if, if we want to draw probably a false distinction between lyric and narrative, mm-hmm. then one thing that, that's interesting to me about lyric is the way, I mean, that, that section that you quoted from, from the story is all about this very quick shift in time, yeah. right? And so what interests me about Lyricism is the efficiency and beauty with which you can move through time very quickly. Um, you know, certain uses of language or you know, changing the register to kind of signal a movement is happening here. Even if it very quickly, as it does in that moment, if it very quickly goes back yeah. to the present. Um, and what I also hope happens in that moment is that it sort of prepares you for um, kind of the, the flood yeah. of, of the lyric later on in the story, that you know this narrator is capable of this, just mm-hmm. giving you a glimpse of it, you know, showing you a little, yeah. you know, showing you just a little bit of the currency before he shows you the riches. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
I do think about poetry a lot this year in this past semester in, in my writing workshop. I um, made sure that we read um, just an article about syntax, hmm. just thinking about syntax. Yeah. Um, you know, this musical arrangement. What does it mean to musically arrange? What, what is the fundament of the sentence? How do you vary that? What happens when you vary that? Um, what happens when you have these interruptive structures? Like, what are you doing? Like, really think carefully about what you're doing with your prose. And of course, that all comes from poetry. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you so much. And um, you guys, whoever has a question, and if you ask a question, then I'll repeat it so that people watching at home can hear it. Yeah. Um, you both address, again, masculinity in your work uh, across different identities, whether racial, ethnic, or sexual identities. Uh, I was thinking about um, everything the mouth eats, where capoeira becomes a kind of performance, but also a way of self-discovery to negotiate these two brothers' relationship um, with their shared memory of child abuse. And I was thinking about Ghost Badar, where a different kind of performance. Um, I think there's a kind of upping of the uh, intensity according to masculinity, you know, how much, how far will you go? Um, I'm gonna put a question mark at the end of this at one point. Um, how does performance function as a way of exploring masculinity in both of your work and um, how is that affected by different identities? Okay, so a question about masculinity and the relationship between masculinity and performance and in relation to a very beautiful story of Jamel's called Everything the Mouth Eats in which two brothers who are not as strange but their relationship is strained by um, abuse that they have both suffered in the past and their relationship to each other is structured by capoeira. I'm actually fascinated by that story and I am really excited for you to answer this question. Yeah, um, yeah, happy to talk about that. I got some capoeira people in the audience today, so um, this is fun. Um, I think the thing, in, the, in that specific case, I think the thing that was important for the two brothers as they're negotiating their relationship is to find a language. Um, and for them, it was, it, it's not speaking. It's not, it's not a verbal language. Um, for them, it's the way that they can communicate to each other physically. Um, and what was important in that story, I think, is that it's, because there's an instance of, of physical encounter between the siblings when they're younger that's violent. Um, and what was important in the physical encounter through Capoeira when they're older is that it's, it's art. Um, the phrase antagonistic cooperation shows up in that story, um, which you can think of in terms of Capoeira, are also associated with writers like Ralph Ellison. Um, and to me, that's the essence of it. The, 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 one of the things that f has fascinated me about Capoeira as a former practitioner <laughs> um, is, is the way that, um, I mean, I felt that, the, the, that, that sense of, of antagonistic cooperation, the, the, the way that you're pushing each other and working together. Um, you are engaged in a competition of sorts, but you're also co-creating something. And what I think happens at the end of that story, what I hope happens at the end of the story is that you get a glimpse of the possibility that these two brothers can begin to co-create something. Um, it's not, it's by no means finalized in the story. It's just a glimmer of a possibility, but um, that's the way in which it was important for me. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? Ooh, someone in the back? Yeah. Speak up for us. Um, my question is um, about how, you know, being in class with you, you talked about the importance of having characters mislay their scripts and how one of the central tensions of fiction in your mind is like the tension between the author and the characters. 
and the ways in which the characters kind of rebel against the narrative structure that's being imposed on them. And so I'm curious if you could talk more about that with this collection specifically and how, you know, the, the idea of secrets came up earlier, but how exactly you get to know your characters well enough that you don't know them anymore. Oh. Wow. Okay. For, former student in the house. Clearly, <laughs> someone has taught this person well. So a question about character, about the relationship between character and author, about characters putting aside their scripts and resisting the narrative structures imposed on them, mm -hmm. and how you as a writer, I love the way you ended that story, that question, the way that you as a writer how you get to know your characters so well that you don't know them anymore, that there's something mysterious in them. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, E, for that question. <laughs> um, the tables <laughs> turn. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so that, so that whole idea that you're talking about is, is one that I um, found through reading James Wood, talking about Chekhov's writing and how Chekhov's characters mislay their scripts. They sort of don't quite follow the plot, and um, it feels like they're these independent agents that happen to exist in the world of the story, and I'm drawn to that idea. Um, a lot of my favorite writers have characters or story shapes that seem to enact that idea, people like Edward P. Jones, for instance. Um, <clears throat> I, I do think that there's, there's a way in which, I mean, I, I, I think I'll try to answer your, your question in terms of knowledge. Like how much you know about a character or how much you allow a reader to know about your character. One of the things that became important for me, just to supply a quick example, um, at the end of the first story in this collection, um, when the narrator reveals himself, mm -hmm. finally, is that there, there's sort of an intimate sharing between two characters that actually the reader does not have access to. Um, we don't know what their names are. Right. And it felt important to me to preserve that, to sort of draw that curtain around the characters and allow that unknown, those unknown names to remain unknown because it said something about their relationship. So in a way, it's sort of honoring those characters and allowing them to have their privacy. And hopefully what comes ac across to the reader is that something charged is happening. There's some energy jumping off of the page. But as a writer, I don't have to rush to supply those things to you. You know, his name was George, my name was Bob. I, did, I, didn't, want, I didn't want to do that, right? I, I wanted it to, to remain something that is, is worthy of honoring worthy of respecting and leaving it to the characters. Um, and I was really inspired by that by, by reading, you know, omniscient novels, uh, like Middlemarch. Yeah, right. In which there are these wonderful moments of the omniscient, all-knowing narration refusing to tell you something about what yeah. the characters are doing or saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's not a failure. For, to me, that's a profound um, display of respect mm -hmm. for those characters. It, it, it makes them feel a little bit more real me. That's great. Last question, please. I have a, a process question that's related to um, what you just uh, spoke on, which is in Arrows, um, we have the main character um, not seeing the ghost character, what she sees in the mirror. Um, he does, in this story, it's um, about a gallivanting woman who's kind of gone outside of her, her marriage and we know that the husband's okay with that, but the story's told from the son's perspective. Um, he doesn't know all the details of her sexual liaisons, and he doesn't know kind of the ghost mechanics either. Um, and those details are revealed really early on, and to me it's like a key to the story. I wonder when you decided that you weren't going to show what she sees in the reflection or go into all the details of her love life that to me unlocks the story. When did you know that that was going to be a rule for writing that story? Well, that's a really interesting question. So yeah, about this story, Eros, that yeah. we learn something about the erotic life of the, the mother, the ghost, very early on, which is that she had kind of an open marriage. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we don't, so the son, who's the POV character, knows that, but doesn't know all the details. Yeah. And then at a particular moment, a kind of key piece of knowledge is blocked off from the reader. So at what point did you understand the rules of knowledge and disclosure mm. in that story? Is that a fair, yeah? Okay. Yeah. I think, hmm, that's a good question. What I can say is that the entire, that's the oldest story in the collection, oh, I'll, I'll mention. Um, I wrote it, I drafted it probably 10 years ago. Um, and one of the difficulties I had with the story is precisely this question of what to say and what not to say. Uh, in fact, the, the, the worst first version of the story is sort of like, is she a ghost? Is she a ghost? <laughs> um, and I was like, ooh, that's cool. <laughs> She's a ghost. She a ghost? But um, I think as, as you sort of peel back the layers on a story, you know, I think it's just true of that story, you realize, well, that's, that's not the question. That's not what this, this uh, narrative is driving at, right? It's driving at something else. And so I clarified the fact that, that she's a ghost. But then some of those details that you're talking about, I think it, um, one charges the fact of the ghost not to know them, right? It adds to, because the ghost is such a, um, a given of the world, I didn't want the givenness of the ghost to lose its charge as a ghost, if that makes sense. So there's a certain amount of mysteriousness that I had to keep in the story, right? Um, as I was driving at what I eventually figured out the story was actually about, which I think is forgiveness. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Congratulations on this beautiful book, Jamal. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Thank you to Garth for moderating such a wonderful conversation. And of course, thank you to Jamal for celebrating this launch with us. So just a few quick reminders before we wrap up. If you're still with us on the live stream, you can buy a copy of Witness by clicking the link in the live stream description. For all of those with us here in the store tonight, um, I know many of you picked up a copy when you checked in, but if you didn't, we have plenty available for purchase up at the register when you checked in. Um, we also have a few copies of Jamel's previous collection, A Lucky Man as well as Garth's novel, Cleanest. Both of those are fantastic, so I highly recommend checking them out. Um, Jamel will be around to sign and personalize your books. That's gonna be happening in our little receiving alcove. My coworker <laughs> Tiffany is pointing to the where that is right now. It'll all make a little more sense in a minute. We just ask that you please grab all of your personal belongings with you, line up down the center aisle and curve around to the door. I think that's all. Thank you all again so much for coming out. Let's give these two one last round of applause. Thank you.